Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. Are you a new or sophisticated investor wanting to learn how to operate a successful syndication business? For life-changing training from the nation's leading syndication expert, my friend Vinny Chopra has the training you need. Text LEARN, L-E-A-R-N, to 474747. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Amy Wan. Thanks for being on the show again, Amy. Thanks so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. And if you're, if you're a frequent listener, you've heard Amy's name many times. She's been very gracious and, and generous with her time and sharing, shared lots of knowledge and wisdom with us in this industry and, and how we can make sure we're staying out of trouble and doing this as legal as possible. Uh, but a little about her, she's a founder and CEO of Bootstrap Legal, which uses artificial intelligence to help draft real estate syndication legal documents faster and cheaper. She has authored LexisNexis, a private equity practice guide. She was named one of 10 women to watch in legal technology by the American Bar Association Journal in 2014 and one of 18 millennials ch changing legal tech by law.com in 2018. Amy, thank you again uh, for your time. And uh, you're, you're a frequent guest now and I'm grateful because uh, uh, it's great to have, um, I mean, somebody like yourself that can come back and just numerous topics. Cause there's so many questions I get also that uh, that people ask me even through the Facebook group or, or just at a conference, uh, assuming that I know, and I'm like, well, I'm not an attorney, but this is what I think. But you know, it's great to have, have somebody like yourself. Thank you again. Yeah, of course. And it, it's super helpful for me too, because sometimes I'm like, Oh, I don't have anything else to talk about. And then like something will come up with a client and I'm like, and you know, and you have to really explain it to them. I'm like, Oh, Maybe, maybe I should talk about this on a Whitney's show so everyone knows. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you again. And, and today, you know, tell us a little bit. I know you and I briefly discussed it, but tell us a little bit about our topic today and then let's jump in. Yeah, sure. So today we're talking about material disclosures, right? Um, and, you know, the, the consequences of what happens if you don't disclose everything materials, um, and, you know, how it all works in practical applications. So, you know, just jumping in, um, there are certain things that you have to disclose to your investors on every deal that you do. And those details include things about the offering or the property itself, right? Like, oh, this place used to be a meth lab or whatever. Um, usually I find that disclosing things about the property is about the property is not that much of an issue amongst clients. But then when we get into personal disclosures, that's when people feel very uncomfortable because you do have to disclose things about yourself and your past as a sponsor, right? So this includes bankruptcies, um, any criminal proceedings, um, any current litigation that you're in, any, um, you know, current uh, investigations or enforcement action, uh, current or previous enforcement um, actions or investigations by the SEC or, or state securities regulators, um, anything of that sort, right? And it does go on for a long time. And, and by the way, when I, say just, when I say bankruptcy, this includes personal and business bankruptcy. So we're covering the entire gamut here. Um, when it comes to bankruptcies, there is no, actually when it comes to any of this, um, there's nothing in the regulation itself most of the time that says, okay, for X specific event, you must, you know, write a paragraph in the PPM that talks about this. Usually most of this falls, um, under what we call material you know, the, the materiality provision, which is you have to disclose whatever is material to the offering. And what is material? Um, there's no hard and fast rule, but because there is a lot of securities litigation that goes on all the time, especially in the real estate investment space, 99% um, of securities attorneys are going to be more conservative than less conservative. So when you ask, oh, is something material? 
what you're really asking is, okay, um, would the reasonable investor wish they knew this before investing in the deal, right? That's, that's really what you're asking. And we're not asking, do you, the sponsor, think it's important? We're asking, would a judge or a jury person feel like they, they would have wanted to know this prior to investing the offering? Um, so, so I, I want to give you guys a little anecdote, um, about why this is important, right? Can I, can I back up just oh, yeah. one second? And so, so material disclosures, is this going to be a specific part of the PPM that's going to list this or have these items that, that should be in there or is it, is it very standard? I mean, I've looked at many PPMs, but obviously a hundred plus pages, I can't remember exactly where that is, or even if I've read this before, <laughs> you know? Right. So, uh, you know, where is this going to be at? Right. So there's no specific place in the PPM um, where it's going to show up, but where you probably want to look right is, um, you know, when it comes to material disclosures about the sponsor themselves, it's probably going to show up wherever they talk about the sponsor. So, you know, either in the deck um, where they have their biographies or, you know, the part of the PPM where it lists who are the sponsors and, you know, a little bit about their background. Okay. And then, you know, disclosures about the, the risks of the investment itself is there's usually a whole section around that. Right. Uh, and I can see uh, definitely the risks around the property or like you said, it used to be a meth lab or things like that, that you have to disclose. But I, I can't imagine, you know, a sponsor putting somewhere about uh, previous bankruptcy around his bio. <laughs> you know? That's why they don't write it. That's why I rewrite it. And then I have to spend, you know, half an hour, an hour, sometimes many, many sessions with the client to explain to them how important it is to have this language in the PPM. <laughs> okay. That's why I'm on this show. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <clears throat> All right. So go right ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, bankruptcies, you know, your, your average securities attorney is going to want to disclose bankruptcies for at least the past 10 years, sometimes more. Um, there's also an important thing where we talk about, um, you know, when we, when we ask about materiality, it's an important thing where, you know, you have to put in details that, uh, you know, are important in assessing the integrity of the issuer. So I basically, I want to give you a little anecdote. Um, I had a client uh, recently in the past couple months where they were partnering with um, someone else. They were, they were both, you know, principals, part of the sponsor. And it turns out that that someone else had something happen to them, you know, 11 years ago with the SEC. That thing that happened 11 years ago um, was not even, you know, it seemed like it wasn't even that person's fault. It was they had a bad business partner 11 years ago. And so the SEC came along, right? So now because of something that someone else did 11 years ago, this guy now had to, now had to um, make sh sure that he disclosed, you know, what happened to his business partner in the PPM. Um they really didn't want to do that. And so we had to have a lot of, you know, come to Jesus talks. <laughs> and, um, you know, we, we basically had to go over what are all the ramifications um, if you don't disclose, right? So, you know, this particular thing did call into question the integrity of the issuer. And so, uh, so, so what happens if you don't disclose? You're potentially leaving out something material for the securities attorney. That's really bad because, you know, that's, that's your malpractice insurance on the line. For the sponsor, um, there, the way I explain it is there's two different things that you have to worry about when it comes to getting in trouble with the law, right? One is the regulators. And so there's federal regulators, which is the SEC, and then there's state regulators. Regulators have limited capacity to go after people, and so they will not go after 
everyone. However, there is, um, so that's regulatory risk. There's also something that we call litigation risk. And that is when your investors go and hire a bulldog attorney to come after you and make your life miserable for several years, if not more, right? Um, litigation risk is often what we're talking about when we're talking about material disclosures. Um, because if an investor comes back and complains that you did not disclose this, this thing that you thought was this one little thing, they actually have a right of rescission for the entire life of the deal. Um, whether they've been paid back or not, if the deal has gone south, they, they still may have um, that, that right of rescission, right? And like we said in the last show, in some states, you even have to buy back their securities, even if the money is gone. Like you don't have the money anymore. You'll be on the hook for that. Um, and this could happen for the length of the deal, you said. So the life of this specific project. Yes, exactly. Now, um, that is, that's where it starts. <laughs> And then it gets worse after that, right? Because once you're in current litigation on a deal, then any project that you do afterwards, you have to disclose that current litigation. And guess what? Now it's material because you've left out some, something that caused them to question your integrity, right? Because you made a decision not to disclose something on a previous deal. So it's this, this cascade of all these different things. And now anyone that you want to partner with um, has to basically dis disclose on the PPM. And so they're probably, they might be less inclined to partner with you because it's, it's just not a good look, right? And so this is why I always say that around these issues, you want to be very, very careful because once you make a misstep it can follow you around for the rest of your syndication career right um it's it's much harder for you to look good doing offerings from here on out and even if you get out of the real estate syndication business it's it's much harder for you to be a director or officer of any organization that is raising capital because they're going to have to disclose it mm. So, uh, you know, I wonder about how, um, you know, when we're partnering with numerous people on a deal, you know, you, you mentioned this, this person's, uh, you know, a partner that they had, you know, many years ago, uh, you know, had an issue and, and obviously, you know, it affected them now as well. And, and cause I, it's a, and actually I wanted to mention show uh, 319 WS 319 was our previous show, uh, which I would encourage people to go back and listen to where Amy talked about ways that, um, people are, are using quote capital raisers end quote, you know, to, and, and how to, they're paying them and how it's not legal and all those things that I would encourage you to go back and listen to a very important show uh, for our industry right now. And, and, uh, but you know, when we're partnering with all those people that, you know, most, most of them have never met each other. Most of them don't know who, the, you know, there may be 20, you know, on some of these opportunities or some of these deals. And, uh, you know, if one of those people have had an issue, uh, you know, like this or bankruptcy or, or, you know, they've had other litigation or uh, whatever, or some type of enforcement actions by the SEC, you know, and, and I've never met that individual. How, how does that affect me, you know, say, you know, on the deal or, or deals going forward? Right. So the liability of all your business partners is your liability, right? And so the more people you have in a deal, the higher risk there is around this sort of stuff. Because, you know, if you've got 20 people in on a deal, which, which quite frankly is, is a lot. <laughs> uh, so if, if you have 20 people in on a deal, um, you know, the chances that you are going to be able to, um, or wh wh whoever is organizing all of this is going to be able to go and figure out like, is there stuff we have to disclose about every single person? I mean, it's, it's so much harder to catch, right? But, but even more than that, um, anything that those other people are running around and doing on behalf of the offering suddenly becomes your liability. If they don't know anything about securities laws, 
and you have a 5-6B offering and they go out and make a public YouTube video, guess what? That's general solicitation. That's on you now, right? Um, you would have to, you know, you would have to do a lot of quick fixes to the offering to save it, I would say. And if some, if you guys didn't catch it and the offering closed, well, A, there's still that right of rescission for investors, um, uh, depending on, on what was said or not said or, or done. And then B, if someone complains about in, in the future, if someone sues about it in the future, guess what? They're going to sue the manager, which is all these, you know, dozen or 20 people, which is, you know, all the business partners involved. It, it's just a huge cascade effect. So you want to always be very careful about who you partner with because everything that they do is also on you and affects your deals in the future. It's a big deal <laughs> that we know, that we understand that, right? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, so, okay. So and now we know that we better disclose some of these things or bankruptcy, even if it's personal. You said it doesn't have to be just something business related or something related to the SEC or some type of, uh, you know, something from a state regulator on our business. But even if it was something personal, uh, any, anything else personal other than bankruptcies that we need to be aware of that must be in there? Um, you know, the, the biggest thing would just be that if there has ever been enforcement action or if the SEC or any state regulator has named you as a bad actor, um, in some in many to, I'll say in many cases that limits your ability to raise capital in the future. Um, in terms of being a bad actor, you would know if you've been named a bad actor because you've probably been, you know, through a lot with the SEC. Um, if you haven't heard from them, you're likely not a bad actor. Um, but you know, in in so so I, I talked about you know some of the litigation risk, but in terms of what the SEC can come back and get you for, right? So they can come back and get you for disgorgement of profits. So everything that you profited, um, they can order you to pay investors back everything. Um, you know, as with every SEC violation, there is a litany of possible punishment, including, you know, uh, penalty fines, um, you know, uh, criminal charges, um, uh, jail time, uh, they could label you as a bad actor. So those are all places, those are all places that you just, you just don't want to go there. Your life will be so much easier if you don't go there. <laughs> In a big way, right? Or, or, or you're going to pick a new career, most likely, if this, if these yes. things have happened, right? And in that new career, um, you, you know, you're going to have difficulty if you want to be a, uh, an executive or director or officer of that organization. Hmm. Okay. So anything else about material disclosures, Amy, uh, that we need to be aware of? I would say that's, that's pretty much it. Um, the other thing is, you know, don't be one of those people where if this has happened to you, um, you jump from securities attorney to securities attorney to find mm. someone who will be willing to represent your deal um, without either making that disclosure or to do the offering in general in case other attorneys won't do it for you. Um, it's not a good look for you. It puts a lot of risk on the attorney. We hate it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you probably recognize somebody that's jumping around pretty quickly anyway, right? Or, or probably by some of the questions that they're asking, you are, you probably understand pretty quick if they're trying to get away without disclosing something. You can, but some people I think are also, they can be very sneaky about it, right? They learn from the first or the first couple of securities attorneys, um, you know, what they're supposed to, or what questions they'll get asked. So by the time they get to you, they um, know how to answer those questions in a way that is less suspicious. <laughs> I understand. Well, Amy, um, it's, I, mean, I really appreciate you telling us about the material disclosures because I, I feel like um, it, the way the people are partnering these days, and we covered that 
you know, on the, on the last show, uh, that this is more important than ever before. Yes, definitely. Um, and, and I, I will say that there's no magic number of how many people is the right number of people to partner with so that it looks, um, so that there's less risk or that there's that, so that you're not breaking, you know, broker dealer laws. Um, what I will say is all of this is a very, you know, fact-based analysis, it's very case by case. Um, and, you know, the more conservative approach you take as a sponsor, um, in terms of security laws, I think the better off you're probably going to be. So how do we, uh, how, is, there, is there a way that we can check others, uh, you know, see if they've ever been labeled as a bad actor or something like that? You can. Um, I mean, there are, you know, third party verification services that will, that you can go out and hire to do this for you. A lot of people don't want to spend the money. And so um, typically, um, you know, your law firm that you're working with is going to either make you guys sign something or make you guys certify something in your intake where you have to, um, you know, disclose, are you in current litigation? Um, have you had any bankruptcies? All of that sort of stuff. Um, and that's, that's typically the way we catch this stuff. And, and if someone makes a misrepresentation to the attorney, well, then they're, they're committing fraud. So. Yeah. Okay. So then it's on them and not you as their attorney. Um, yes, exactly. Right. Because we can really go, we can really just go off the information that we're working with. All right, Amy. Well, uh, it's a very important topic today, and I appreciate you elaborating on these disclosures that we need to know that, that we have to put out there. Um, and it's important for investors to know as well. And I, and I hear of more passive investors now doing like background checks and credit checks and things like that, you know, where they're going to catch maybe some of these things, uh, you know, and then, you know, if they know to do this, they would probably would compare that to, to this, uh, to your PPM or, uh, you know, and see if you've disclosed these things or not. Uh, and I've heard of some passive investors who are, uh, who have checked, you know, backgrounds and they're very su uh, surprised at, you know, what they find. And even if it's many years ago, uh, you know, then they, they go to ask the operator or, you know, something about what happened. And sometimes it's not a big deal, but then other times they're very thankful that they checked. Um, yeah. so, um, so, you know, tell us though, before we have to go, how do you like to give back? Yeah, so I was actually thinking about this question the other day when you asked it of me and talked to my husband, and I was like, I'm a parent. I'm, I feel like I'm helping raise the next generation. But, and I was like, you know, I was like, I, two years ago when I had my, when I got pregnant and had my kid, I actually um, removed myself from a lot of the, the boards I was on. And so I, I feel like parenting, at least in this phase right now, is how I give back because it, it's, it is all consuming. I completely understand. <laughs> <laughs> completely understand. That's awesome, Amy. And, and tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you. Sure. So my website is bootstraplegal.com. Um, you can always book a consultation there or just email me at amy, A-M-Y, at bootstraplegal.com. Um, I'm not so much on, you know, LinkedIn and Twitter and all of those things these days because, you know, of, of all the spam messages. So email and, and my website are the best way to contact me. Great. Amy, thank you again. And we will talk to all the listeners tomorrow. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.